So right there where Kumbi's heading is the entrance to the forest. And you can tell by all the grass here, <laughs> among other vegetation, that now that we're down to just two horses, they are not coming in here at all. So very interesting information about how many horses it takes to feel safe coming into potentially dangerous areas. Coyotes come in here, but also if the winds kick up at all, the branches, there's a lot of trees dying in here all the time. A lot of branches could fall on them. They also haven't been to the back pasture at all. Again, mostly because of coyote threat. You know, maybe once every five or eight years, there's a bear in the area, but not common. More common is a cougar will pass through. So with two horses, this is just right near the entrance and they're not even coming in here. So again, not just watching and listening to your horses, but also watching and listening to their environment and seeing what their environment has to tell you about how your horses are feeling and what they're thinking and where they feel safe and where they don't feel safe. So we have a tiny bit of grazing here right at the entrance not much here and then when we get to here you can see this is how this is how far to the entrance they feel safe so i'm going to turn around and that's it that's the entrance to the forest and i'm about mm, 15 feet away and that's as close as they're going so this open area, as you can see, is really eaten down. But as soon as we start getting into bushy areas where any predator can hide, they're leaving quite a wide perimeter. So you might come out here and say, oh, they have plenty to eat. But if they don't feel safe eating, then what's the point? It's gonna be stressful for them. And if they don't feel safe, maybe they're not safe. Maybe they're being smart. So let's see if Kalia wants to show us anything else. And the fact that Mama's hanging back is interesting too. I'm gonna walk back towards the entrance to the forest and see if they'll come closer because I'm here normally they do. But I tried to walk to the back over there and they would not, they just followed me. Odie just followed me halfway and stopped. She was like, no way. Just inside the entrance here. There we go. And I'm gonna stand here and see what effect that has on their safety and their behavior. Also, Odie has a really weird rash on her nose. And at first it looked like sunburn, but then it looked like an actual rash. And now it's there's parts of it that have gone hard and crusty. And I've never seen, out of 11 horses here, I've never seen anyone with anything like that. So that's making me wonder what did she get into a plant or could it even be some kind of insect bites, but we've never seen it before. So the environment has changed significantly. And we offered her calendula, comfrey, diluted wild oregano. She doesn't want anything on it. And uh, it's been about a week now and it's starting to heal up. So 
We trust that she knows what she wants. She's happily accepted diluted wild oregano for all the bites in her udder area and her chest. She's totally fine with that, but she doesn't want anything on the, the woundings on her face. So it doesn't look like they're gonna come over here at all. Not only are their bodies away from me, their energy and their intentions, their attention is away from me. So that's a clear message. That's clear communication and a clear answer. As humans, we tend to only like to hear answers that involve yes. <laughs> or or maybe, or I'll think about that. And we're we're when we get a no, when we get a hard no, we're like, oh, they're not talking to me today. Yeah, they are. They just gave you a hell no. So always be on the alert for that because we have a default that when that happens, we think we're not communicating and we think it's not working or we're not hearing them, but we actually just don't like the answer we're getting. So now I'm going to change the question and I'm going to follow them and I'm going to ask them, do you, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to stay back so that to minimize the ask for scratches and distraction. And I'm going to say, is there anything you want to show me? What I did see in my walk through the woods is a ginormous wasp nest hanging from a tree branch, which I'd never seen before. And I, I kind of wondered, man, if there weren't human roofs and barn structures, where do these wasps build their nests? And I just had it answered. And uh, the wasps were very nice to let me take some photographs, but um, I also felt from them to keep a really wide berth. And then I felt for them to get out of the forest as soon as I could that, you know, it's not a good idea for me to be in there. So maybe there's a lot of wasp nests all over the forest this year. I don't know because I listened to them and I took the nearest path out. I'm going to follow Kalia. Is she going to the water trough or is she going somewhere else? I'm going to show people your nose. Yeah, you got some things on your nose, don't you? Super, super short grass everywhere around here. This is to so that if birds or rodents fall in the water, they can get out and also so they can perch there and drink the water. Same with insects too. Helps minimize the deaths in the water trough. I wonder if you guys are going up towards the front at all. It's like, just follow the short grass pathways and see where they end. See, they're just, it's, it's like right here and they're not going over there and they're not going over there at all. So they're either getting enough to eat from these short pathways or they don't feel safe going anywhere near the the brush and it stops here so they're not eating in this whole front area at all so if I were to guesstimate I would say they're eating from a patch oh maybe two and a half acres big and the rest, they're just not even touching. But, you know, they're fine. They're not skinny. So yeah, just another afternoon of listening to your horse, listening to the land, 
listening to the environment, the trees, the wildlife, keeping your senses open for any signs and knowledge that wants to come. how she keeps her coat so shiny. I once watched Cobra stay down on the ground with his front legs out and rock back and forth so that he could scratch, rub his groin on the dirt to get at the bug bites that were there. So again, at first glance, you're like, oh my gosh, he can't get up. And then you watch and you realize, oh no, he's using the ground as a scratching device. This is another place Kalia and the other horses like to come to scratch. And that's in among the cedars with their low hanging branches. So she's using that one to scratch her legs. And oh yeah, you're getting your butt in there too. There's a hole perfectly positioned clump of branches there for scratching. There's a cedar at the far end of the pasture that the branches are at the perfect height for scratching her sacrum, her pelvis and her back. Yeah, we love cedar, don't we, Kalia? We're so grateful to cedar. So if you're wondering why wild horses don't need our help, she just showed you. She had a roll in the dust which helps scratch her itches, but also coats her with dust to protect against the biting bugs. And then she's come in here to show you how she uses what's available in nature to get at all her itches and scratches. And I've seen them use a branch sticking out at an angle to scratch inside their ear. Wish I had filmed that. So here's something else I've noticed just by observing. There are way more flies on the horse's face. And even right now, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, depends which part of the barn they're standing in, but a lot of flies like there never has been before. And when you look to, well, why? Okay, first of all, there's only two horses. So we don't have the fresh manure going into the pits, creating lots of food for wasps and hornets. And if you look, I have these wasp and hornet nests all over the barn that are empty. These should be teeming with wasps. Normally there are, but there are all empty and for those of you who watched my video on the message from hornet wasp uh there's no there's no hornet and wasp nest see there's there's where one was in my last video that's where the big wasp nest was attached it's gone but what we do have here and I don't know how much this has impacted. It was done about mm, three weeks ago. A woman came and installed an owl box. So that's it up there. And I don't know how owls impact wasps and hornets, but 
even before she installed the, wall, the owl nest, there were no wasp and hornet nests here. And you can see here's, here's the other one that was a big nest in past years and this year nothing. So is that just because of the weather and the ebb and flow of nature or there's, there's no nests on this shelter whatsoever, which is like an ideal wasp and hornet nest place. Or is it because we don't have enough horses to produce fresh manure to produce the number of flies that would feed the wasps? So where's the food source for the wasps? Like, look at my manure pits. My manure pits are turning into fields instead of poop. Like the vegetation has taken over because there's not enough fresh poop to be a breeding ground. So again, when we can observe things, it also helps us to realize how interconnected everything is. It's one thing to intellectually understand the concept of an interlinked ecosystem, and it's quite another to live, breathe, and experience it through all the seasons in your own personal environment. So just an encouragement to each of us, no matter what your environment is, just start becoming aware of all of the elements, plant, insect, fungi. Sometimes in the water runoff, you'll see uh, bacteria, different colored bacteria. It doesn't matter that you don't know what it is or why it's there, just start noticing. And over time, maybe years, little pieces of information are going to filter down to you. And it's pretty freaking cool. Okay, well, thanks for joining me and Kumba Bear on this beautiful summer day.